How we doing, Elevate Life Church? Anybody in the room love Jesus? Can we make some noise for the King of Kings? Come on, the Lord of Lords, author, perfecter, finish of our faith. So happy you are in the house today. You can high five someone, say, you look better than I remember. <laughs> Grab a seat. Praise God. If you have a Bible with you, turn with me this morning to Luke chapter 1, Luke chapter 1, I want to read a few passages of scripture. The Lord put a word on my heart as you guys are in this revival season and also 20 year celebration mark. Can you just give yourselves a big round of applause? 20 years going strong. And I got to be honest with you, I walked in today and just what a sweet sense of God's presence in this place. And I really believe the best is yet to come, not out of cliche, but out of conviction that what God has done in the past, he's only simply getting started. And, you know, for me today is a real privilege and a real honor. Um, I so love this house, and I so love the leaders of this house. Pastor Keith and Sheila Craft have been, as you just heard, uh, family, friends, and really family to our family for many, many years. Not just on the Wilkerson side, but I represent two families. Uh, the Wilkerson, which is my blood, then the woman that I chose, her name is Dawn Cherie Duran. And the, on the in-law side, the, we don't say in-laws in my house, in love. Uh, but... Both of our families, the Durons and the Wilkersons, have been so impacted by the Kraft family in this church. And I cannot even begin to testify just how many moments, crucial moments, that this couple and this family has shown up and sowed into our family with words, sowed into our family with finances, sowed into our family with prophecies. And uh, we would not be where we are today without your leadership, without your life. And I honor both of you 20 years of leadership. The whole reason why I came to Frisco today was just to sit next to you in this service and hang out with you and be jealous of you that you're bigger than me and you can sing like that. What can you not do? I've got a long way to go. But come on, can we put our hands together and thank God for the pastors, the senior pastors of this house and how much we love them. Come on, let's make a little bit of noise. We're in revival season. Let's just thank God for... We love you guys so, so much. And look, we started a church four years ago. And it's, you know, we're in high schools. We, we, this morning, people loaded in at 545 out of a semi-truck. We're in two high schools and close to 5,000 people right now showing up each week. It's, it's, we're in a fun revival season. But I do not believe that we would be where we're at today once again without your church. And you just heard Pastor Keith talk about the fact that our first year, uh, $2,000 a month, which when you're just getting going, not only does that help in a very practical way, but just the confidence and the security and the belief in ourselves that if Pastor Keith and Pastor Sheila and Elevate Life believe in us, well, maybe we can do this. And um, your pastor's taught me a whole lot of things, but one of the things he's taught me is generosity. And we've got a long way to go as a church, but today is uh, a day that we're celebrating 20 years. And so from Voo Church, we wanted to make sure we didn't come empty handed today. I brought a, a $20,000 check from Voo Church just to say, we love you, Elevate Life. And so I wanted to give you that before I even brought the word today. I love you. I love you so much. I love you. You're the best. Just... We just believe the next 20 years is better. So, in fact, we're going to send 4,000 because I didn't, I forgot the math. And so we're going to make sure that you, that's a good return. Not even a good, you didn't even get any interest on that. But we just believe we're sending that in the mail this week. I don't know what we're doing. That was a silly number. Someone thought that because the year anniversary, but it should just have been even more. So it's going to be more. Luke chapter 1, verse 56. I got a message today. Uh, maybe you're new to church. You're like, man, this is a whole lot of like man honoring man. No, the scripture says that we're to give honor where honor is due. And this is one of the ways that we change culture is by actually opening up our mouth, looking man to man, looking at one another and expressing what someone has meant to you. And my life has been radically changed because of your house. And so I know you're kind of like, man, these guys are getting really emotional at 9 a.m. I know, sorry, you came on a weird Sunday. But um, it, it's emotional for us because uh, we're putting our lives into this and um, we would not be where we're at today without you. I've got a message that I want to share. Luke chapter 1, verse 56. Let me read some passages of scripture and then I'm going to take the next... Uh, um, 52 minutes, no, I'm kidding, of uh, 18 minutes to uh, encourage you. Luke chapter 1, verse 56 says this. It says, when it was time for Elizabeth to have her baby, she gave birth to a son. Her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown her great mercy, and they shared her joy. And on the eighth day, they came to circumcise the child, and they were going to name him after his father, Zechariah. 
But his mother spoke up and said, no, he is to be called John. And they said to her, there's no one among your relatives who has that name. Then they made signs to the father to find out what he would like to name the child. He asked for a writing tablet, and to everyone's astonishment, he wrote, his name is John. Immediately, his mouth opened, and his tongue set free, and he began to speak, praising God. All the neighbors were filled with awe, and throughout the hill country of Judea, people were talking about all these things. Everyone who heard this wondered about it, asking, what then is this child going to be? For the Lord's hand was with him. I want to read verse 66 out of the Berean Study Bible because I like the way it says it. It says, And all who heard this wondered in their hearts and asked, What then will this child become? For the Lord's hand was with him. Everyone say, Become. I want to talk for a few moments around this subject. How did that become this? How did that become this? This Would you pray with me all over this room? Let's believe that the Lord's going to speak to us. Lord, we thank you so much for what you're doing here at Elevate Life Church. Lord, we believe, God, that all that you have done in the last 20 years is really, Lord, just setting us up for the next 20 years. God, I pray that today, Lord, as I speak, Lord, that Jesus would be revealed, but also, Lord, that hearts would be opened, that vision would expand, that dreamers would rise up, that resource would come, that we would see this area of Frisco, that the gospel would go forth and many lives would be transformed because of your word. God, we believe you can do it and you will do it, and we give you praise in advance. And if you agree with that prayer, all of God's people said... Come on, all of God's people said? Amen. Come on, if you love Jesus, make a little bit of noise. Elevate life. Now, I don't come from the biggest church, but I come from a hollerback church, okay? So you can say amen. You can say I like that. You can say preach it, white boy. I don't care. But on the count of three, I just want to make sure I'm in the right church this morning. Ready? One, two, three. Try one. Wow, there's a lot of, we'll, we'll leave it alone right there. Um, I've been married to the same woman now for 13 years, amen, and um, some of you might have heard our story, but we went on a journey of eight years of infertility, and after waiting and praying for eight years, our God, who is so faithful, um, he sent us our firstborn son, Wyatt Wesley Wilkerson. Now, that's a mouthful right there. His initials are WWW. We call him World Wide Web for short, Okay. <laughs> But how many know that God, he, he's a good God. He, he doesn't just meet us at our need, but he exceeds our needs. Uh, in October, my wife gave birth to our second born son, Wild Wesley Wilkerson. I know, wh wh what are we thinking, right? We're just prophesying some crazy stuff. With names like that, they're either going to be preachers or bank robbers. We're not sure yet. <laughs> but that's my family right there, Wyatt and Wild, and that's my lovely wife, Don Cherie Duran Wilkerson of 13 years. Are those not the most, the cutest boys you've ever seen? You know, I think we have a pretty good marriage, but some of you married folks, you know that sometimes something can start real small, and then if it's not watched, it can become real big. Has this ever happened to you? Um, Christmas Eve, I woke up, well, I should go back one day before my wife said, Rich, tomorrow's Christmas Eve, and I'm going to be preaching at the Christmas Eve service, and we don't have anyone helping us tomorrow, so in the morning, you got both the boys. We got an agreement? I said, yes, ma'am, of course we've got an agreement. And so I went to bed that night. I woke up the next morning, and when I woke up, my wife, she was still asleep, and, you know, I just I saw her sleeping there. The, the, the baby, Wild, was, was, you know, right next to us. And then uh, my son, Wyatt, I could hear him screaming, just sounded like he was possessed or something. And so I came out. He was doing cartwheels and Tasmanian devil stuff in the, in the living room. I said, son, come here. And he's just going crazy. I said, you know what? I'm going to be nice to my wife. I'm going to get my, I'm going to get Wyatt out of the house. So I said, let's go to breakfast, son. So I leave my wife and Wyatt asleep in the room, and I take my son to a Christmas Eve breakfast. I'm a really good dad. And so um, we start driving down, and I'm kind of an extrovert, you know. Like, I like being around people. I'm real social. And so we go to this little restaurant on South Beach, and we sit down. We start eating breakfast, and we're finishing breakfast, and a friend of mine hits me. He's like, hey, bro, what are you doing? I said, I'm just wrapping up breakfast. He said, that's crazy. I was about to go to breakfast. I said, well, why don't you come over here? We'll have two breakfasts. 
So my friend comes over, we start having two breakfasts, we're having a good time, we're probably an hour and 15 minutes, you know, hour and a half into the morning, and I'm wrapping up the second breakfast, and I should go back home, but all of a sudden my phone rings, it's another friend down in Coral Gables, he said, bro, what are you doing? I said, I just wrapped up my second breakfast, what are you doing? He said, that's crazy, my wife and I, we're going to breakfast, want to come? I said, yeah, it's Christmas Eve, who doesn't want three breakfasts? I've now been out of the house for two and a half hours, and I have my son, and I get to the restaurant, and when I get to the restaurant for my third breakfast, my phone rings, and it's my wife, and she says, Rich, where are you? I said, um, <clears throat> I'm going to breakfast. She said, where did you come from? I said, <clears throat> from breakfast. <laughs> she said, you need to come home right now. I told you I needed your help this morning. I said, yes, ma'am, I'll do it. And then I broke the rules, and I went and sat down for 20 minutes. Don't, don't judge me. You got problems in your marriage, too, Okay. <laughs> I don't know, have you, have you ever been like away and like, you know, your, other, your spouse is like hitting you up. Like my wife is writing me novels, but I'm trying to act like everything's together. I'm like, yeah, this is so good. It's Christmas Eve with these friends. Like everything's perfect at home. And um, I, I leave the breakfast. I'm like, oh no, I'm, I'm in trouble. You know, like I'm in real, this is not good. And so it's Christmas Eve and I walk into the house. And when I walk in the house, my wife, she's very godly, very, very amazing, but she was not happy. She said, where have you been? I said, you know where I've been. I've been at breakfast. She said, Rich, who goes to three breakfasts? I said, babe, it's Christmas Eve. Jesus got three gifts. I thought we should have three breakfasts. <laughs> My wife, she went to another level, but the point where it made me laugh the most, she looked at me, she was so frustrated. She said, Rich, when will you ever get a chance to show me and the boys that you love us? I said, what just happened? Is this like an annual opportunity that I get one chance to prove my love to my wife and my boys? I'm sorry I went to breakfast, babe. And then I begged for forgiveness. She kissed me. We made up. And marriage is going really good now. <laughs> Have you ever had a moment where something started really small, but then before you knew it, it got really, really big? And you look back, you kind of go, how did that become this? This is not the Christmas Eve I planned. And you look back and you say, maybe I should have paid attention to it when it was small. There's a principle that if, if you don't pay attention to small things, small things have a tendency to become big things. It happens. Like this is why you got to pay attention to some of the negative things in your life. Because you want to know how you ruin your life? It's called one small compromise at a time. No one wakes up and says, you know what I want to do this year? I want to become an addict. That doesn't happen that way. It's one small thing at a time. No one wakes up and says, you know what, I want to have an affair this year. That doesn't happen that way. It's, it's one small compromise at a time. See, whatever you nurture will grow. And you could define nurture by whatever you feed or protect. I wonder, what are you feeding in 2020 that you ought to be starving? I, I wonder what you're protecting that you ought to let the Lord confiscate from your life <laughs> because whatever you nurture that's going to grow in your life now the good news is if this is true in the negative how many know this is true in the positive right. see here, here's the truth the truth of the matter is is if this year in 2020 you will begin to nurture your body if you'll give yourself six months in the gym eat right and go to the gym you're going to look at a picture of yourself and you're going to stare at it and say my goodness how did that become this <laughs> If you'll just begin to nurture your relationship right now, you're going to look back in a year and say, how did that broken thing become this beautiful thing? If you'll just begin to nurture your relationship with God, it might seem like you barely have any faith today. But I promise you, if you begin to feed it, if you begin to protect it, you're going to look back in some time and say, how did that little thing become this great, strong thing? How did that become this? See, the question I have for all of us, collectively but also individually, is simply this. Who are you becoming? Who are you becoming? Because the only thing more important with who you are today is who you're becoming tomorrow. I think what happens to us in life is we get so trapped with where we are. And we start thinking, my greatest problem is where I am. Let me tell you, your greatest problem is not where you are. The biggest problem is where are you headed? Because direction is more important than speed. 
And you have to declare over your life, I am becoming. I am not done growing. I'm becoming a better follower of Jesus. I'm becoming a better husband to my wife. Amen. I'm becoming a better father. I'm becoming a greater leader. I'm becoming a pastor worth listening to. I'm becoming a man worth following. Now, if you're not careful, you might say, but Rich, aren't you already all of those things? And the answer is yes, but the fact that I am becoming excites me because what it says is, is it says I still have gaps in my life. Now, the gaps don't depress me. The gaps ignite me. Why? Because every gap in my life is an opportunity for growth. Every psychologist would tell you that the key to happiness is progression. And I got good news for you. Every weakness, every gap, every challenge you have is another opportunity for you to become more in the Lord. You are not done growing. You are not done becoming. You're going to look back on your life and say, how did that become this? I can already see some husband on Monday using this with his wife. Babe, don't judge me. I am becoming. <laughs> I am becoming. You, you are, who are you becoming? Whatever you nurture will grow. Small stuff, when it gets nurtured, becomes big stuff. I love this principle and I love this truth. And I, I think the story of John the Baptist is one of these fascinating moments in the Bible that so illustrates this. Um, uh, we looked at this morning at the text of the birth of, of John the Baptist. And just to put it into context, it's a really, really amazing moment because when, when John was born, literally those that were there, they could sense that this birth was supernatural. This birth was significant. We should pause right there because I want to let you know that in the same way that John's birth was supernatural and significant, so was yours. Your parents might not have planned you, but God certainly did. You are not an accident. You are born on purpose for a purpose. You are supernatural. Science is still trying to catch up with the DNA in your body. You need to understand that you are fearfully and wonderfully made, that all the days ordained for you were written in his book before one of them came to be. You have a purpose. And all of these people, they were there at the birth of John, and when they saw John born, they literally stepped back and said, what will become of this child? I wonder, this little baby, who is this baby going to become? There's many things we could mention about John, but, but John was passionate about his purpose. John was the cousin of Jesus. Can you imagine being the cousin of Jesus? Like, I just think about that. That probably had some advantages, probably had some disadvantages. I mean, some of the advantages, like you go to school with Jesus, you know, like nobody messes with you. <laughs> Yo, you, you're going to keep doing that? You want me to call Jesus? No, no, no. You want me to call Jesus? I'll, I'll call him right now. No, 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 no lightning bolts, you know? Like, I don't want this guy to open up, you know? Imagine being at school, like, snack, you know? Like, everyone's trading stuff. Jesus is like, yo, just give me a Lunchable. They're like, why? One Lunchable, he feeds the whole cafeteria. Everyone's like, I like that guy, you know? <laughs> Disadvantages. Like, how many know, you don't get a sick day when Jesus is your cousin. Nah, mom, I can't go to school today. You don't understand. Like, I got that test. I'm feeling sick. Call Jesus. You're healed. You're going to school. You know, like, imagine trying to play sports with Jesus. You're out there on the swim team like, oh, my goodness, I'm going to be the first Michael Phelps ever. You look over, Jesus is walking on water, you know. You're like, this ain't fair, bro. John is the first cousin of Jesus. And they grow up together. But when you study the life of John, what you see about John is John was passionate. So many things that we could talk about when it comes to this man. But the greatest thing was, was that John was passionate about who he was born to be. You see, his purpose was to be the forerunner of Jesus Christ. He was to prepare the way for Jesus, he was to get everybody ready for the Messiah to come. He had one message. It was repent and get baptized. And when these neighbors looked around and said, what will this child become? The answer is he became a whole lot. Literally, his name became John the Baptist. I know we got First Baptist Dallas. No, John was the first Baptist. <laughs> like literally. Like he was baptizing people. 
His purpose, it, it became one that would set the stage for Jesus. His, his passion became greater and greater and greater. He had the mantle of Elijah on him. He was loved by the masses. He was hated by Herod. And ultimately his life came to an end with his head on a platter. And you wonder, how did that little baby become so much? I think the only way to answer it is by John's own words found in John chapter 3, verse 30. This is what John said. John said, he, speaking of Jesus, must become greater and I must become less. Jesus must become greater and I must become less. Listen to me. The more Jesus becomes greater in your life, the more your calling becomes clearer in your life. I don't know what all your goals are for 2020, but I'm hoping at the top of your list, the greatest goal of your life is that you would say, I wanna be more in love with Jesus. I wanna be a greater follower of Jesus. I want a deeper relationship with Jesus. Come on, is there anybody out there who would agree with me today and say, I, I must become less and he must become greater. How did that become this? I wanna make two observations around the story of John. I want you to write these down because I think these are all very, very fitting for you in the season that you are in as a church with revival, but also as you step into the next 20 years. Here's what we know about the next 20 years. We know that the future is always more demanding than the past. If you're gonna grow, the future is always more demanding than the past. How do we know? Well, what's the reward for passing the test in the third grade? A harder test in the fourth grade. <laughs> So we have to make a decision to say, all right, I'm going on the journey of becoming. I'm going on the journey of process. I must become less and Jesus must become greater. Two things I want you to see from the text. Number one, the miracle is in your mouth. Everyone say this out loud. Say the miracle is in your mouth. Let me read this verse to you. It's Proverbs chapter 18, verse 20. I read it out of the message version. I like it the way that Eugene Peterson put it. He says, words satisfy the mind as much as fruit does the stomach. Good talk is as gratifying as a good harvest. Words kill, words give life. They're either poison or fruit. You choose. You choose. Your mouth has the power of life or death. You cannot speak defeat and expect a victory. You cannot speak lack and expect abundance. You cannot speak gossip and expect to have healthy relationships. The miracle is in your mouth. You got to start speaking your future into existence. I mean, this is all over the Bible. This is why the prophet Joel says, let the weak say that I am strong. Well, that doesn't make any sense in the natural. I'm weak, but I'm going to say I'm strong. That's because you don't speak in the natural. You speak in the supernatural. I might look weak today, but I'm going to declare that I'm going to be strong tomorrow. You're going to look back and you're going to discover that which was weak actually became strong. The psalmist David said, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. I don't know who I'm preaching to today, but is there anybody in this room who can testify that Jesus Christ saved you, sanctified you, redeemed you? Why don't you go ahead and take five seconds, give him praise today that he didn't give up on you, that he didn't quit on you, but he loved you in spite of you. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Open up your mouth. Open up your mouth and give him praise. The miracles in your mouth. The Apostle Paul said, call those things that are not as though they were. The miracle is in your mouth. How are you going to become as you step into this next year, the next 20 years? You're going to recognize that what I'm saying is producing the life I want to see. Research would tell us that you and I every week speak enough words to fill up a 500-page book. I wonder, what kind of book did you write this past week? Was it a horror story? <laughs> was it a mystery? Was it a drama? Was it a lie? We have to start speaking on purpose because the miracle is in our mouth. 
Now, this is very, very important when it comes to the story of John the Baptist, because today we read the text of John being born, but you got to back up and you got to recognize that even before John was born, there was things that was prophetic and supernatural about his birth. The story of John began with when Mary, the mother of Jesus, discovers that she's going to be pregnant, which is a funny story in itself, like, uh, you're going you're gonna to have a baby. Well, how? I'm a virgin. The Holy Spirit will come upon you. Okay, you know, like, okay, so what does Mary do? She runs to her cousin Elizabeth and says, Elizabeth, um, I, I'm pregnant, but the scripture says that when she walks into the room, the baby on the inside of Elizabeth, John, he begins to leap and he begins to dance. It's like John was like, yo, I can't wait, bro. Like, I can already sense my purpose as Jesus comes in. And the scripture says that before even that moment took place, that Elizabeth was married to a man by the name of Zechariah. Zechariah was an Old Testament priest. Now, a priest is somebody who goes to God on behalf of the people. He, he knows God. He speaks to God. And the scripture says that one day while Zechariah is in the temple offering sacrifices, the angel of the Lord appears to Zechariah and says, Zechariah, uh, hey, bro, um, your wife is going to have a baby, and you're supposed to give him the name John. Now, the scripture says that when Zechariah hears this, he does not believe the promise of the Lord. In fact, let me just read it to you because I like how the scripture says it. This is Luke chapter 1, verse 18. Zechariah asked the angel, um, how can I be sure of this? I am an old man. Watch this. Zechariah is a good husband. And my wife is well along in years. <laughs> the angel said to him, I am Gabriel, and I stand in the presence of God. And I have been sent to speak to you and to tell you this good news. And now you will be silent and not able to speak until the day this happens because you did not believe my words, which will come true at their appointed time. I want you to see this picture. Zachariah and Elizabeth for many years are believing for a child. But finally now, Gabriel, the angel Lord, shows up to Zachariah and says, Hey, God's heard your prayer. And uh, we're going to give you a baby, and this baby's special. This baby's to be named John, and he's going to be the forerunner to Jesus. But when this promise comes to Zechariah, what does Zechariah do? He doubts it. It makes me wonder that when he was praying, did he actually believe what he was praying for? It makes me wonder, did he actually have an expectation that God would actually fulfill it? I wonder, are we just praying prayers, or are we actually praying prayers that we believe God is going to answer? And I love this picture. I don't want you to miss this. He doubts. And so the angel says, okay, um, change of plan. Change of plan. Here's the deal. Uh, this is going to happen. And for the next nine months, uh, you're not going to be able to speak anymore until the baby comes. And you say, well, why did God silence his mouth? I believe God silenced his mouth because God knew uh, if I don't shut you up, you might just talk yourself out of the miracle. I don't know if you had a mom like mine, but my mom used to say, uh, if you ain't got nothing nice to say, we had the same mom. Shh. If you can't speak faith, it's better to stay silent. Some of you, you have already begun to talk yourself out of the breakthrough that God wants to bring to your life. You have already begun to talk yourself out of the things he wants to do in and through you. I am telling you, if you don't have the strength to speak faith, it would be better for you to be silent. Because if you're not careful, you're going to speak yourself. You're going to talk yourself out of the miracle, out of the victory, out of the progress. You're going to talk yourself out of stopping becoming who God has called you to be. I love it. John doesn't speak for nine months. And finally, after nine months, we pick up in our text. Elizabeth gives birth. Everyone's in awe and everyone's in wonder. And they say, what are you going to name him? Elizabeth says, we're going to name him John. They don't like that name. They say, that's not our family name. What is, the, what is 
you know, dad want? Dad's name is Zachariah. And Zachariah's like, yo, get me something to write with. And so they give him a tablet. And he writes down the name John. And as soon as he writes down the name John, his mouth opens up. And what does he do? He starts to praise God. Why? Because as soon as he wrote down the name John, I want you to see what happens. This is the first time that Zachariah is getting into agreement with God. I want to make sure that you're hearing this right, because this is not just some old message or some kind of watered down that you can just speak anything and expect God to do it. The goal is not to get God in agreement with our words. The goal is to get our words in agreement with God. Obedience opens the door to your future. Come on, somebody. The miracle is in your mouth. Somebody give God praise in this place. become this we spoke it into existence we spoke faith we didn't back down in the valley we kept declaring God is good even when it seemed like he wasn't the miracle is in your mouth the worship team's coming up but secondly I want you to see as we close today simply this number one the miracles in your mouth but number two everyone say this say grow slow, grow slow. come on say it once I say grow slow. grow slow this is so important that you see this today grow slow. You see, John's passion for God, it grew. It didn't just start the way, it grew over time. John spent much of his time out in the wilderness in the desert all alone. Look what the scripture says. Luke chapter 1 verse 80. And the child grew and, what's the word? Became strong in the spirit and lived in the wilderness until he appeared publicly to Israel. The child grew and became strong. He didn't start strong. He became strong. It was in the wilderness. It was when he was in the desert living in privacy. I don't know what it is, but God loves to grow your spirit in desert seasons. God loves to make you strong. Before he gives you a public message, he always gives you a private message. Before God does something in front of a crowd, he always does something with you alone. And we see John that he was just committed to growing slow. The great tragedy of today is that we live in this world that there's so many resources and there's, there's, there's so much information and there's so many tools. So many of us, we give up before we can ever see the harvest. We see something, we see that, but we don't recognize that started like this. We don't understand that things start and they, and they grow. See, see, God is not into speed. God's into seed. <laughs> you got you to learn this because God, he, he can do things quick, but I've learned following God is slow then fast, and then slow some more, then fast, slow, fast. Because you serve a God who's, who's into seed over speed. John, he, he was in the desert. That's where his passion grew. That's where his purpose evolved. Out in the desert, he learned how to preach. Maybe you're here today, and I just got a little word for you. Your life is a seed. I hope you know that your life is a seed. I don't care where you are at today. Where you're at today is not nearly as important as where you're headed tomorrow. What you see today, friend, I'm telling you, I'm living, the, I am becoming something. I'm becoming who God has called me to be. I know at times it can feel like life is burying you. Like, Rich, you don't get it, man. My marriage, it's buried. My job, it's buried. My faith feels buried. But friend, you're not buried, you're planted. You're a seed in the ground, and it's just a matter of time before that seed reaps a harvest. You just got to commit, grow slow. Why do we grow slow? Because God understands that things that grow fast tend to not last. Today, if you're a guest here to Elevate Life, I want you to understand that this didn't grow fast. It's been an amazing growth pattern. But this is 20 years patiently persevering, consistently showing up, consistently casting vision, consistently getting our words out in front of where we are and just saying, we're committed to the journey. I had to show you this. I'm, I'm, we're going to close in prayer, but this just messed with me the other day. My wife showed this to me. Um, there's this plant. I, I wonder if we have it. It's called the century plant. There it is. 
This is such a cool plant. This plant is called the century plant and it only grows in deserts. What an interesting concept in itself. It grows in desert wilderness areas. And what's really interesting about this plant is you can see it, there it is. It's like at max, it's like three feet tall. And when the century plant is planted or when it begins to grow, it, it just stays there. One year, two year, three year, five, five years, 10 years, 20 years, it just stays that size. The century plants had a lot of New Year's resolutions. <laughs> but then something supernatural happens. Around the 20 year mark, the century plant, watch this, shoots up to 20 or 30 feet tall. Can you go back to that other picture? I just wanna, I wanna make sure people are seeing this today because this is a picture of, how did that, that become this? Go, go back, because I just wanna make sure before you get into Monday, you're going back to that job that you think is petty and small and insignificant. You're going back to that dream that you think will never ever, fl I want you to go back. How, how did that, that thing that seems small and little become this, this massive thing, this big thing. 20 years the same, then all of a sudden, year 21, something begins to shoot up. Something begins to accelerate. Something all of a sudden begins to speed up. It's because God is slow fast. And if you're here today and you've been a part of this journey, this century plant should not surprise you. It should not shock you. How did that become this? Well, that's the story of Elevate Life. Because how did that? Noel Smith Elementary. 20 years. They have balloons for a stage design. You don't know about balloons for a stage design? That's called balling on a budget. Don't come into this beautiful cathedral today and just think it was always like this. No, this is a house that decided we're going to grow slow. The miracle is in our mouth. We're going to nurture it. And before you know it, that all of a sudden becomes, show the next photo of this. Oh, come on, somebody. I'm trying to get some faith in your heart. I'm trying to wake up a vision inside of you. God is not finished with you yet. He is just getting started. Your best days are in front of you. They are not behind you. How did that become this? Can you stand to your feet all over this place? Hallelujah. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. If you're here today and you're in this room and you're saying, Rich, that's me, man, preaching to me. Can I speak faith over your life? Can I? Can I speak the best is in front of you? Today, this is not mind over matter. This is faith over unbelief. This is not just positive thinking. No, we've got something much better than that. We have a Savior named Jesus. And the only reason why we can say the best is yet to come is because we are in relationship with Jesus. We know that we're going to spend eternity with Him. So regardless of what happens in this life, we already believe the best is yet to come. If you're in this room today, before we go out and before Pastor Keith comes back up, if, if you've never met this Jesus, John gave his life to pointing people to him. His entire purpose and passion was all about pointing people to the Savior. He must become greater. I must become less. The more Jesus becomes greater, the more my calling becomes clear. If you've never surrendered your life to Jesus, I just wonder for a moment, Scripture says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. John chapter 1, verse 12 says, Yet to all who received Him and believed in His name, He gave them the right to be called children of God. You can't pay for a blessing. You can't pay for salvation. He paid the price. You can't achieve Him. You just receive Him. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. If that's you today, would you just be bold on the count of three? Just lift your hand up high enough and long enough. I don't want to embarrass you, but I want to challenge your faith that everything begins with a relationship with Jesus. Hands are already going up all over this room. I love this church. I've been praying for you all week. That's why this church opens its doors. That's why this church does what it does is because we're believing for you. Hands are already going up. But on the count of three, if that's you, would you just join them ready? One, the Bible says today is that day. Don't put it off to next Sunday. Next Sunday is going to be good, but I don't know if it'll be better than the moment the Holy Spirit's speaking to you right now. Two. Don't look at your neighbor. Forget about your neighbors. between you and Jesus. Ready? One, two, 
three, if that's you, just lift it up. That's me, Rich. I want Jesus to be the Lord of my life. Thank you, God. Come on, church, can we lift our hands towards heaven together? Pray this prayer out loud together. Say, dear Jesus, today I surrender all that I am over to you. I give you my past. I give you my present. I even place my future in your hands. I'm yours, Lord. Forgive me. I turn towards you. I believe you are who you said that you are. Today, take my life. I follow you. Lead me. Now with your hands lifted up, Lord, I pray for this church. I pray for every person that is a part of this house. God, today we believe the miracle is in our mouth. God, you have been so good to us in the past that it gives us faith for the future. And today we speak over Elevate Life that, Lord, what you have done in the last 20 years is just a glimpse of where you're taking us in the next 20 years. God, today, Lord, we commit again. We're signing up again that we are involved heart and soul. Lord, bring a revival to Frisco. Bring a revival to Dallas. Let us be in the room. Let us be a part of ushering in your presence into this area. Let us see something the world has never seen before. Let us look back at the end of our life and say, how did that thing become this thing? And may we all testify together it was by the grace of God. He gets all the glory and all the praise. If you believe it today, all over this room, can you go ahead and put your hands together and can you give God a shout of praise? Hallelujah.